the hearing will come to order, and I want to welcome everyone to this very first hearing in the Congress on the implementation of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, a truly landmark piece of legislation, bipartisan legislation, that has the potential to alter the dynamic of our ongoing struggle with the People's Republic of China, but only if it's implemented faithfully and properly. And make no mistake about what the stakes are in the struggle against the Chinese Communist Party, N not something anodyne like a simple quote, strategic competition. Rather, we are in a survival struggle with a dictatorship, an authoritarian state that seeks global hegemony and the fundamental displacement of the United States and the liberal economic order throughout the world. To that end, the PRC will take advantage of the Western world's liberal trade uh, regime, regimen, I should say, while utilizing forced labor to give itself an unfair trade advantage, all with the ultimate objective of imposing its governance model upon the rest of the world. We have known for years that the PRC has, has used forced and indeed prison labor. Indeed, I knew this as far back as 1991, when former Congress Frank Wolf and I, a member from Northern Virginia, uh, we went to Beijing prison number two and found that at least 40 Tiananmen Square activists were being forced to make jelly shoes uh, and socks for export to the United States. Uh, we asked for and got from the warden there, his name was Warden Joe, uh, samples that we brought back and got to the customs authorities uh, and said this was being made by Tiananmen Square activists, human rights activists, uh, and therefore it is violative of the Smoot-Holy Act. He put an import ban on it and the place closed. Of course, they just moved uh, their operations elsewhere, but it showed that when you have information that is actionable, uh, we can have an impact on the Chinese uh, Communist Party. There, are some, there was some personal satisfaction uh, that we had from that, but again, not that much practical effect. And impacting the PRC's policy of utilizing forced labor, it was uh, next to zero. In this case, we had an evidence uh, and a unique set of circumstances. I would point out that both George Herbert Walker Bush, and then it was followed by Clinton and others, used to brag about how, it, how we had a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, with the Chinese Communist Party, that if we thought something was being made uh, through slave labor, we would bring it to them, they would investigate, and then tell us what the results were of, the, of their investigation. Uh, I remember meeting with some of the um, uh, people in customs in, at our embassy in Beijing, and some of you may remember years ago, there was a, uh, an ad uh, with the Maytag repairmen. They made their washing machines so well and, uh, that they never had any work. Uh, they were always idle because there was no work. Well, these two customs officers reminded me of the Maytag uh, repairmen. They had nothing to do because nobody had actionable information that they could bring forward. So the MOU, while it sounded great as a talking point at hearings, and the Clinton people trumped it up every time I said, not worth the paper it's printed on. We have to be able to investigate, not them. Uh, and of course, there was no, no implementation. And that, that's where, you know, we, that's the genius of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. The burden is no longer upon the good men and women of the CBP to provide goods that have been made by forced labor, but upon importers to prov prove that goods made in Xinjiang uh, and elsewhere are free from the taint of forced labor. For we know now that the CCP under Xi Jinping has declared war on the Uyghur people, labeling them, labeling them as terrorists who must be destroyed root and branch. Matter of fact, during the debate on the floor, I quoted uh, where Xi Jinping himself said, show no mercy to the people uh, in that region, and they have shown absolutely no mercy. This has led to massive detentions of more than a million people, maybe many more, of Uyghurs, many of whom are forced to labor and are subjected to horrific human rights abuses, including forced sterilizations, forced abortion, and indeed forced organ harvesting. You recall a bill that I had introduced, passed the House just a few weeks ago, uh, putting a heavy focus on trying to combat uh, that heinous crime uh, of, of organ harvesting and Along with the Falun Gong, we now know that the Uyghurs are being targeted uh, to steal their organs, to literally put them on an operating table and take out one to three of their organs uh, in a terrible, terrible procedure. 
These human rights abuses are what the legislation is designed to combat. We know from reports released yesterday in advance of this hearing that CBP has seized over $961 million worth of goods since last June. This is an important start as it is CBP's holding uh, of a tech expo for industry last month and its launch of a dashboard to track trade statistics. As co-chair Merkley and I, joined by ranking member McGovern, who just joined us, and I will yield to him momentarily, and Senator Rubio stated in a letter addressed to the Department of Homeland Security last week, uh, we do remain concerned over the lack of full transparency that would enable Congress to evaluate the efficacy of implementation. We are also concerned as to whether the rebuttable presumption standard is being fully implemented and whether goods that are initially detained are subsequently being released without congressional or public reporting. We have questions as to why the robust entity list uh, of bad actors uh, that the legislation requires remains uh, so spartan. We also question whether CBP is utilizing technology to its fullest to identify goods produced, produced in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, uh, such as isotopic and DNA testing. Finally, we question, we also question whether goods produced by forced labor outside of the autonomous region or being captured. We have been working with Homeland Security to follow up on well-founded reports that work gloves sold under the Milwaukee uh, tool label in venues such as Home Depot are indeed produced by prison labor at a prison in Hunan province, uh, to be precise. Going forward, we will be taking a closer look at companies such as the Milwaukee Tool and their alleged profiteering from forced labor, just as we have highlighted the role of Thermo Fisher Scientific in genetic data collection uh, that enables repressive practices in both Xinjiang uh, and in Tibet, and more nefariously has been implicated in finding DNA matches from organ harvesting victims. And it is my hope, it is our hope as a commission, uh, that the legislation will prick the consciences of corporate actors. Some of our testimony clearly suggests that they're getting that message, uh, that we mean business, uh, the administration and the Congress, and that is a good message that for them to get. We encourage them to scour their supply chains and make sure they are free from the taint of forced labor uh, if, and not to engage in transshipment either uh, to other countries where uh, it is the same good uh, but just with a different uh, indice on it or in uh, a uh, uh, statement of origin. Um, finally, uh, it is my hope that we'll, uh, the corporate actors will respond uh, very favorably and will embrace this wholeheartedly, uh, raising the cost of doing business, of doing business in PRC. It is also our hope that companies will determine that bottom line concerns will motivate them to do the right thing. Finally, those, uh, for those who are incorrigible and seek to skirt the law, we will seek enforcement action and bring public scrutiny uh, to bear. I'd like to now yield to my good friend and colleague, Mr. McGovern, uh, for any opening comments he might have. Well, uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for scheduling this hearing, and I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses on the implementation of the Uyghur Forest Labor Prevention Act, its impact on global supply chains, and how we might improve its implementation. Uh, on a personal note, as the author of the House legislation uh, on the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, I want to thank my partner in this legislation, Senator Rubio, and fellow ranking member, uh, and fellow ranking member, um, and my good friend and colleague, Senator Merkley, for his leadership, and of course uh, uh, to Chairman Smith, uh, not only for his leadership on this, uh, but for again organizing this important hearing. This group of bipartisan members of the House and Senate, I think demonstrates the strong bipartisan support that this issue has received in both the House and the Senate. Um, since uh, the UFLPA was signed into law, we have seen significant efforts by Customs and Border Protection, the CBP, and the Multi-Agency Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force, the FLETF, to implement uh, the bill. As the lead enforcement agency, CBP has been a strong ally in its implementation. The law itself recognizes that implementation is multi-sectoral. It requires engagement, cooperation, and action by CBP, but also by the private sector, including importers, and by NGOs, uh, which have research uh, and monitoring capabilities. Last week, uh, the CECC chair, co-chair, and ranking members, namely Congressman Smith, Senator Merkley, and Senator Rubio, and I wrote to DHS Undersecretary Robert Silvers 
who chairs the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force, to request more information on certain key aspects of the law's implementation to date. Due to the timing of today's hearing, neither CBP nor DHS were able to appear and provide their views and insights on implementing uh, the legislation. I look forward to a future hearing where we can hear uh, about their experience and suggestions for how, we how, for how to pursue comprehensive enforcement. Uh, the uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act was a targeted response to a specific, very serious human rights problem, the widely documented intentional use of forced labor in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region of China. The use of forced labor is one of a set of interrelated policies implemented by the People's Republic of China against Uyghurs and, and other largely Muslim Turkic peoples in the region that, taken together, likely meet the legal definition of crimes against humanity and genocide. In the law, by forced labor, we mean all work or service which is exacted from any person under the menace of any penalty for its non-performance and for which the worker does not offer himself or herself voluntarily, a definition first applied in tariff law in the 1930s. But Section 3 of the bill, which establishes a presumption that the import prohibition applies to all goods mined, produced, or manufactured in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, represents a new, even revolutionary approach to protecting human rights. Basically, instead of presuming that the norm is the human rights violation, basically, instead of presuming that the norm is that human rights violations are not committed, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act presumes the opposite, that the standard practice is that rights violations are committed. This presumption is grounded in research that found that, one, the use of forced labor is pervasive in the Xinjiang region, and two, because there is a lack of transparency in independent investigations and audits, it is impossible to distinguish between industry and manufacturing that involves forced labor and that which, and that which does not. So the law establish, establishes an appeals process that allows a company to make the case that a good that that uh, its goods are not produced with forced labor, but to do so, the company must provide clear and convincing evidence that they are not. And there are several issues that merit attention as we review the implementation of the bill, which my colleagues have noted uh, in their opening remarks. So I'm not going to repeat it. But as the implementation of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act advances, there will be lessons learned that may lead Congress to tweak the bill or, re or, re or related law. But it's worth repeating that the prohibition on importing goods made with forced labor is longstanding, and what th this bill provides is a new approach and new tools for enforcement. So the interest in improving enforcement is here to stay. It's also important to remember that while the operational aspects of the bill are clearly focused on the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, the statement of policy in the law is broader, namely, to lead the international community in ending forced labor practices wherever such practices occur through all means available to the United States government. American consumers should not have to wear clothing or footwear or eat food or use devices made by forced labor wherever it occurs. American companies should not profit off of forced labor. In brief, Mr. Chairman, I believe the vigorous, successful implementation of the Uyghur Forced, uh, uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act can establish, can establish not just a model, but a roadmap on how to address forced labor everywhere. And I think I speak for everybody here who is involved in drafting this bill and fighting for it. This is not a check the box uh, initiative. I mean, uh, this is serious, and all of us up here, Democrats and Republicans, are interested in making sure that it is enforced and implement and, and that is implemented faithfully, um, and we will continue to monitor that. So, with that, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. I'd like to now yield to the co-chairman of this important commission, uh, Chairman Merkley. Uh, Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Weir Forced Labor Prevention Act is a testament to why the Congressional Executive Commission on China exists. Horrified by the evidence documented by the commission's tireless researchers that the products of slave labor reach American shells in vast quantities, the four most recent chairs of this commission acted. And coming from the Senate side, a special recognition to Senator uh, Rubio, uh, who uh, partnered in the bipartisan effort on the Senate side. On a bipartisan and bicameral basis, we introduced, advocated for, and passed landmark legislation that sent a resounding and unequivocal message that the United States would not stand idly by as the world witnesses the evils of genocide and the evils of slave labor. 
This law, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, aims to target China's ability to profit from genocide, hold corporations that trade in products of forced labor accountable, and protect American consumers from being unwitting accomplices in these horrors. In the 16 months since it became law and 10 months since its key provisions went into effect, the UFLPA has made a difference. As we'll hear today, it's put businesses on notice that they can no longer claim it's too difficult to trace their supply chains. Armed with substantial new resources provided by Congress, U.S. Customs and Border Protection now devotes unprecedented attention to investigating those supply chains and stopping problematic imports. As a result, direct exports from Xinjiang have plummeted and businesses are changing their practices to speed up production capacity elsewhere in the world, increasing the diversification and sustainability of their supply chains. But as much as we've accomplished, it's only the tip of the iceberg. Compliance with this law requires a paradigm shift. It requires companies to be vigilant in the same way expect them to guard against bribery and corruption and money laundering. Companies that resist compliance or look to exploit loopholes need to be held accountable. The U.S. government's Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force needs to implement the law even more aggressively with particular attention to transshipment of Xinjiang origin goods via third countries. Congress needs to make sure these efforts are fully funded and that any gaps we identify are plugged. And countries around the world need to take their own actions to make sure that the purveyors of forced labor can't just send their goods elsewhere. That action by other countries is needed to avoid bifurcated supply chains that allow companies to sell clean products in the United States and turn around and pocket the proceeds of tainted forced labor products elsewhere. It's a big challenge to implement a law, and it's a big challenge to implement this law with the complexity of international trade. But we owe it to the millions of exploited Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in China. And as my colleague mentioned, this isn't just about China. This is about taking on this issue and setting a model for how we deal with it around the world. We owe it to American consumers who don't want to be part of economic machinery of genocide and to the businesses doing the right thing who want to play on a level playing field. It is a, a honor and a responsibility to take on this task in partnership with my colleagues on both sides of the House and both sides of the aisle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Merkley. I'd like to now yield to Ryan Zinke, uh, former Interior Secretary and a distinguished member of Congress. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is my honor to serve in this, you know, I think, important committee. Uh, let's just call China what it is. Uh, China is the largest polluter of emissions. We know that. Ninety percent of the world's plastics come from four rivers in China. There are islands in the Pacific that are larger than 800 kilometers in diameter. They're the largest offender of illegal fishing, and I'm deeply concerned about our reliance and their monopoly on critical minerals and components of the emerging EV world. In particular, I'm concerned about our reliance on cobalt, nickel, and critical minerals that China has either monopoly or control and is using labor force to acquire them. The allegations and substantiated documentation of organ harvesting, I can think of no crime that is worse. So let's call China what China is and let's work for a bipartisan solution to address the human rights for humanity in a country. And America, by the way, leads. For those that doubt, I, su I would suggest you look otherwise. But America leads, and this is an important effort to expose, identify, and create solutions that matter. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zanke. Uh, Ms. Weston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The U.S. Customs official recently referred to America's current de minimis policy as our country's, quote, free trade agreement with China. But just last week, the co-chairs and ranking members of this commission sent a letter to Undersecretary Silvers expressing concern over, among other things, the ability of CPPP to enforce the UL UFLPA and de minimis shipping allows vendors to import goods without having to report basic data such as a country of origin and manufacturer 
if the claimed value is under $800. In that letter, this commission's leadership points out that the, the, the Chinese companies such as Jean and Temu raise concerns about direct-to-consumer purchases. These two China-backed online retailers make up an enormous share of the U.S. market. From February 26 to March 26, 2023, Temu and Shein came in first and fourth in the five top five most downloaded apps in the U.S. across Apple's iOS Store and the Google Play Store, with over 10 million and 6.3 million do do downloads, respectively. Shein was the, was the most downloaded platform for beauty and fashion in the U.S. in 2022, with 27 million downloads. Sheen has been accused of harvesting data on their customers and using it to manipulate their supply networks and to make products at lower cost than their competitors, fueled by underpaid and unforced labor and raw materials from China. In February, a bipartisan group of U.S. Senators called on Sheen's CEO to answer, to answer questions regarding findings by Bloomberg that garments ship, shipped to the U.S. included cottons from Xinjiang's, the, the garments that shipped to the U.S. included cotton from Xinjiang's Xinjiang region in China. On Friday, the U.S.-China Economic Security Review Commission published a review and issued issue brief further, further outlining Xi'an's concerns uh, concerning patterns and practices. All the while, Xi'an continues to exploit our current de minimis policy to sell billions of dollars worth of goods to American consumers, evading customs requirements ranging from tariffs to forced labor protections along the way. In fact, the business, the, the, the business strategy has been so successful that it now holds the largest share of the U.S. fast fashion market, beating out giants like Zara and H&M. What's more, Shine recent, recently, recently valued at over $100, $100 billion, aggressively raising capital and plans to, to execute an IPO before the end of this calendar year. In and in con to conclude, it is imperative that we take action to mitigate Shein's, Shein's, uh, Shein's exploitation of the current U.S. dominion's custom policy to ensure a fair and competitive marketplace. Additionally, we must assure companies and importers have the, have the, have, have, are absolutely committed to prioritizing human rights over profits. Thank you. Go back. Thank you very much, Ms. Wesson. I'd like to now yield to distinguished your colleague, Mr. Dunn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for this bipartisan committee for coming together to speak on this very timely and important issue. To the people of China, let us be clear. Here in the United States, we hold a friendship hand forward. There is an on-ramp for us to work together and to have a successful future. But to the Communist Party of China, let us also be very clear. The exploitation, the, the bold-faced lies, everything from surveillance balloons to what they're doing within their own border, will not be tolerated by the United States, and they must be held accountable to the same international norms the rest of the world is facing. I want to thank our panelists for being here today and providing the testimony so implicit in understanding what is happening with inside Communist China today. As we've witnessed through countless acts, China is a repeat offender of humanitarian rights violations. As a former senior intelligence officer in nearly two decades working as a counterintelligence officer inside China myself, I've experienced firsthand what the Chinese intend to do both in their global threat as well as domestically to their own population. The Chinese government's treatment of ethnic minorities and forced detention of over a million Uyghurs in re-education camps is yet another blatant violation by the Chinese government, and it's abundantly clear that China will do whatever it takes to achieve not only global domination, but an infliction against its own people at any cost. The Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, as was highlighted today well by our chairman, is an important step forward and provides a powerful tool to address the human rights abuses and promote a fair labor practice in the global supply chain, prevent goods produced within the Uyghur forced labor camps from entering our markets here domestically in the United States. Since enforcement began in June of 2022, the Customs and Border Protection estimates it's detained nearly a billion dollars alone worth of products that were meant to be sold in the United States coming from these forced labor camps inside China. These were meant to be purchased by unknowing consumers and presented by the state-sponsored communist Chinese government as a way to offload its billing. Likewise, we've seen business shift their supply chain practices in order to retain access to the U.S. market, from corporations developing compliance and due diligence programs to ensuring supply chains are free from forced labor around the world. But despite these efforts, industries attempting to enforce actions to date still exist. One of the biggest challenges our companies confronted when trying to comply with the UFLPA is the lack of visibility into their supply chain and where it's coming from. We have become increasingly globalized in a complex network of supply chains, and the Chinese have used this to exploit and hide in plain sight where these sources are coming from. In China, companies are also responding to our, our 
actions here in the United States by shipping products to third-party countries and then finding a way to infiltrate U.S. markets, not unlike their production of core elements of fentanyl that are poisoning our streets. The United States must be persistent in its efforts. And in this committee today, we are addressing exactly that. The long-term benefits of improving human rights and ethical practices in the global trade are vital for a sustainable future for both the United States and our friends within China fighting against this. So let me be clear. My position on companies here in the West and around the rest of the world, they're using forced labor camps in their supply chains. These companies also are complicit with China's blatant human rights abuses and should immediately develop compliance and due diligence programs to ensure that their supply chains are free of forced labor. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and discuss the impact and the challenges of the UFLPA, as well as our steps in Congress to ensure that the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region is no longer the global epicenter for modern day slavery. Thank you, and thank you for allowing us to participate in this. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunn. I do want to thank you, especially for the expertise you bring to bear, having lived it. Uh, so we'll look forward to tapping that that wisdom that you will bring to bear on this committee. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Michelle Steele, I believe, is online. Um, I'm not sure if Michelle wanted to make any opening comments. Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you, you don't mind for, hosting the, this, thank you. for hosting this important uh, hearing. Um, the human rights abuses happening at the hands of CCP should horrify every one of us. In 2021, Congress worked together and passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. I'm glad this commission is reviewing the implementation and we are working to ensure that we put an end to forced labor in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Thank you to the witnesses for sharing with us your expertise on further congressional oversight and other charges needed to improve on this key issue. I just spoke this morning on the floor regarding the Vietnamese and CCP's human rights violations. They're putting their innocent people inside a prison because they are asking for freedom and democracy. I wanna ask, um, Elfeder uh, Eltiver, if I mispronounced it, I'm sorry. I also sit on the China Select Committee. I recent, recently spoke with a survivor of Xinjiang region that is now using her platform to raise awareness to the world. She shared emotional stories about women being raped and experiencing other type of sexual assault can you share about the living conditions and quality of life in Uyghur? Thank you. Um, Michelle, uh, we're going to have the opening statements first and then go to questions, but uh, I know that Elfadar will take that and, and respond to it. So thank you so much for your opening comments. Uh, I'd like to now welcome our very distinguished panel, beginning first with Anna Suya Siam. Ms. Siam is the Human Rights and Trade Policy Director at the Human Trafficking Legal Center. She leads the Human Trafficking Legal Center's initiative on the U.S. Tariff Act and forced labor, with a focus on conducting investigations and submitting petitions under the Tariff <laughs> Act. She is the co-author of the Practice Guide, quote, Importing Freedom, Using the U.S. Tariff Act to Combat Forced Labor in Supply Change which provides advocates with the nuts and bolts of using the Tariff Act to halt goods made using forced labor from entering the United States. Ms. Siam received her bachelor's in law with honors from the National uh, University of Advanced Legal Studies in India and graduated with a master's degree in international law from NYU School of Law. This is her first time testifying before Congress and it won't be the last, so thank you and we welcome you wholeheartedly. We'll then hear from Laura T. Murphy. Uh, we'll do it by way of a Zoom. Uh, is Professor of Human Rights and Contemporary Slavery at the Helena Kennedy Center at Sheffield Allen University. She is author of numerous books and academic studies on the subject of forced labor and human trafficking globally. Her current work focuses on forced labor in Xinjiang, 
uh, including the automotive, solar, apparel, and building material industries. Her work is extremely useful to the CECC, and she is joining us today from Greece. So great is her dedication, and thank you uh, for joining us today. We'll then hear from Kit Conklin, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center and a global executive that specializes in issues at the intersection of technology, commerce, and international security. In addition to his work with the Atlantic Council, Mr. Conklin is the vice president at the research and data analytics firm, Coron. Uh, Mr. Conklin previously served in various national security positions uh, within the United States government. He holds an MS in emergency and disrupting technologies from the National Intelligence University and an MA from Middlebury Institute of International Studies. I'd also note that he delivered two keynote addresses at the Custom and Border Patrol's Tech Expo just last month, uh, which did a tremendous service to enlightening businesses that participated as to the dangers of sourcing goods made with forced labor in the PRC. And then we'll finally hear from El Fadar El Tekabir, who is the president of the Uyghur American Association, or the UAA. Uh, Ms. Etabar is was born in uh, Xinjiang, uh, uh, also known as e Turkmenistan. She immigrated to the United States in 2000. She has a BA in marketing from George Mason University and over 20 years of marketing and project management experience. She has taught the Uyghur language to U.S. government employees. As the daughter of a prominent Uyghur writer and journalist, she is an active member of the Uyghur community and an outspoken human rights activist and has provided totally important and valuable insights to this commission and to other uh, committees of Congress that deal with Human Rights House and Senate. In the previous three years, she served as Secretary General of the UAA. She was elected as President uh, in May of 2022. She is currently well known to those of us in DC, and I would note parenthetically that her sister uh, works for Senator Rubio, and we're glad of that, and is present with us here today. Finally, I note that we have received written submission for the record from Bobby Sanders, Robbie Sanders, of the Coalition for Prosperous America, and I ask for the unanimous consent it be included uh, as a part of the record. I'd like to now yield uh, to our first witness, uh, Ms. Sayem. Chairman Smith, Co-Chair Merkley, and distinguished members of this commission, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the implementation of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, <clears throat> one of the strongest pieces of legislation ever enacted to tackle forced labor in global supply chains. We are here because we know that letting goods made using forced labor circulate freely in global markets is not only morally reprehensible, it also undermines fair trade and hurts local businesses and workers. As one of the world's largest economies, the United States has significant leverage to make access to its markets contingent on the eradication of forced labor. We welcome this administration's proactive efforts to enforce the UFLPA. A good indicator of success is in the way enforcement, both under prior Xinjiang WROs and now the UFLPA, has catapulted forced labor into a serious compliance issue for companies and investors. Senior officials in the US government, including DHS Undersecretary Robert Silvers, underscored this change recently in the way forced labor is being perceived by the C-suite. According to Undersecretary Silvers, forced labor is now a top-tier compliance issue. We agree. Forced labor is no longer the provenance of weak codes of conduct or CSR measures. What changed? The advent of substantial legal and enforcement risk. Nevertheless, a few challenges do remain when it comes to UFLPA implementation. CBP's recently published UFLPA dashboard reveals gaps. Between June 22 and April 2023, CBP targeted 3,588 shipments worth 1 billion US dollars, but only 490 or less than 0.13% were actually denied entry into the US market. The rest were either released into the US or are currently pending review. Apparel and textile products valued at just $3 million make up 291 of the 490 shipments denied entry by CBP. These low detention numbers and low dollar value are concerning, especially when this sector is prioritized by the US government's implementation strategy. We also worry that CBP may be missing shipments containing inputs from the Uyghur region that enter the United States via third countries. 
CBP should have a specific strategy to address this issue, a critical element of which must be a robust program of on-site third country verifications. Another big gap is in the data around re-exportation. Of the 490 denied entry, we don't know how many shipments were sent to Canada, Mexico, or another country. We need to ensure that these countries are not dumping grounds for goods denied by CBP. Re-exportation data is critical for civil society as we support international partners in advocating for similar import bans in other countries. The dashboard also shows thousands of shipments pending review. Many are currently mired in applicability reviews, a process by which importers can show that the UFLPA does not apply to their shipments. The burden of proof applied by CBP in such reviews is much lower than the clear and convincing standard required to rebut the forced labor presumption. We need more visibility into the applicability review process to ensure that companies are not sidestepping UFLPA enforcement. Another issue that has garnered a lot of attention recently, including among members of this commission, is the de minimis loophole. Shipments under $800 are exempt from duties and may enter the United States without formal entry documentation, a major impediment to collection of data necessary to enforce import bans. Last fall, Bloomberg News reported that Xinjiang cotton was found in apparel shipped by a major Chinese fast fashion company to U.S. consumers. This confirmed what many had long suspected. Companies, especially e-commerce platforms that rely on direct-to-consumer models, may be circumventing the UFLPA. We need to revise our de minimis provisions, including mandating the collection of supply chain data from shippers to ensure that this is not exploited as a back channel entry for goods made using forced Uyghur labor. Many of these goods actually enter the United States via air or land transportation. Currently, only maritime shipping data is shared with the public. Public disclosure of all trade data is critical to our efforts to trace forced labor risks and facilitate enforcement. We call on Congress to mandate public disclosure of trade data involving all modes of transportation. The United States cannot act alone. There should be no safe harbor for goods made with forced labor anywhere in the world. A patchwork of import ban laws with different standards will only frustrate enforcement. In the absence of international coordination, we run the very real risk of companies simply dumping these goods in other countries, especially our neighbors, Canada and Mexico. The USMCA requires each of the signatories to have import bans, but so far, the US is the only country implementing one. The US should push Mexico and Canada to enact similarly robust bans on goods from the Uyghur region. We should also work with our G7 and G20 allies to ensure global adoption of import bans that are consistent with each other. I will close by noting that we are at a pivotal moment in global trade one where trade sanctions have become the norm in efforts to address forced labor across the supply chain. We acknowledge the enormity of the task before CBP and other agencies in the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force. By addressing the gaps outlined in the testimonies today, along with the more robust forced labor enforcement strategy, we are confident that the US government can create the economic pressure needed to disrupt forced labor in China and around the world. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Siam, for your testimony and your expertise. I'd like to now yield to Laura Murphy, um, if she wouldn't mind um, signing on. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Thank you, Chairman Smith and Co-Chairman Merkley, for convening this meeting. And thank you to the Congress people who have supported the rights and freedom of Uyghur people. My name is Laura Murphy, and I'm Professor of Human Rights at Sheffield Hallam University in the United Kingdom. I've studied forced labor globally for 20 years, and my work for the last three has focused exclusively on the Uyghur region of China. The Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act is indeed landmark ed legislation, as we've heard several times today. Those of us who study forced labor have long known that legislation of this kind is critical to ensuring the rights of workers in our global supply chains. It is disturbing to realize that it took a genocide for us to understand just how dire the consequences of our ignorance and inaction could be. It is commendable that the U.S. is the first to create legislation that levels real economic costs on the PRC government's state-sponsored forced labor program. While we still have a long way to go before we intercept all products made in the Uyghur region, the UFLPA is indeed working as it was intended. 
In the short nine months that the UFLPA has been in effect, we have seen swift and decisive enforcement response and targeted funding allocations. This law has protected American consumers from unwittingly buying products that we know to be made in the midst of a genocide, in the shadows of a massive internment camp system by people who are forced to leave their children and parents and land and culture and religion and communities behind to work in the factories that make the goods we buy. Since the UFLPA went into effect, however, companies have not all responded enthusiastically. Many U.S. corporations lobbied to prevent the law from being passed and then fought to limit how it would be enforced, and now are complaining that investigations are not convenient for them. Many companies still have their heads in the sand, hoping that their products will not be scrutinized. Some are shifting the burden of due diligence onto their suppliers, rejecting the responsibility and the costs of knowing the conditions of workers in their supply chains. They throw their hands up as if helpless, uh, as auditors in China are jailed, their offices ransacked, and they refuse to admit what is becoming increasingly clear, that there is no feasible way to verify labor standards compliance in the Uyghur region or of Uyghurs working outside the region. They care about the safety of their directly employed Chinese uh, based personnel, but do not worry about the Uyghurs who at, are at the end of their supply chains. This all shows that companies across sectors must be compelled through rigorous enforcement to comply with the UFLPA. In China, we're seeing companies pretend to sell their Uyghur region factories only to transfer them to executives within their own leadership team or family. They change the names of their subsidiaries to obscure their identities. They ship their products through other countries to mask their origin. They bifurcate their supply chains so they can continue to sell goods in the U.S. market while selling Uyghur forced labor tainted goods elsewhere in the world. Some of those companies are benefiting from Inflation Reduction Act incentives while continuing to operate or source in the Uyghur region. The U.S. should prohibit companies from using U.S. government incentives to expand their manufacturing in the United States while they continue to profit from Uyghur forced labor in China. Our research team at Sheffield Hallam University has identified 55,000 companies operating in the Uyghur region. We have published in-depth investigations that have documented at least 150 specific companies for which there is significant evidence of participation in state-sponsored transfer of Uyghur laborers. And yet, confoundingly, the UFLPA mandated entity lists include only four of the companies we identified as offenders. And exactly zero new companies have been added to the list since the UFLPA was passed. Under Secretary of Homeland Security Robert Silvers recently committed to expanding the entity list. The U.S. government needs to make the entity list a priority and make them make those lists as comprehensive as possible per the mandate of the UFLPA. Congress should be clear to FLETF that it must presume that all state-sponsored labor transfers in the Uyghur region constitute forced labor and that FLETF should add any company engaged in those coerced transfers of labor onto those lists. These lists will assist importers in ensuring that they know which suppliers to include from their sourcing. Lastly, some international companies and governments are claiming the UFLPA is merely a product of a trade war between the U.S. and China in an attempt to justify their indifference. But the UFLPA is not a national security measure like certain technology export restrictions, nor is it a measure intended to offset economic injury to U.S. companies and workers like anti-dumping and safeguard duties. The UFLPA fundamentally expresses U.S. support for internationally recognized human rights. It is crucial that U.S. government encourage our allies to align their laws to prohibit the import of forced labor-made goods. But this must not be conflated with policies intended to advance geopolitical or economic interests. I'm pleased that we're having this hearing to review that all that the FB, uh, UFLPA has accomplished and to consider what more we can do to lead the world in addressing this crisis. Even though Uyghurs continue to be forced to work in China, we in the United States should not be financing their suffering. Thank you. Ms. Murphy, thank you very much for your uh, testimony and your expertise being brought to bear on this important piece of legislation. Um, and next steps. So thank you for that. I'd like to now uh, yield to uh, such time as he may consume to Kit Conklin. Thank you and good morning. Chairman Smith, Chairman Merkley, distinguished members of the commission, 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I would like to start by saying that all views are, are my own. Uh, as discussed by others, the UFLPA bans the import of goods or commodities from China produced with forced labor. Specifically, the UFLPA mandates a rebuttable presumption that assumes any products made wholly or in part uh, in the Xinjiang Uyghur uh, autonomous region or by any Chinese company on a U.S. list of entities involved in the use of forced labor are made with forced labor and therefore banned from importation in the United States. Um, as Dr. Murphy discussed, reflecting the increased international consensus on the need to address forced labor, U.S. trading partners around the world have also enacted or are introducing legislation uh, to ban products made with forced labor. Uh, these include the European Commission, Germany, France, Canada, Mexico, amongst other jurisdictions. Each of these bans similarly require importing companies subject to the laws of these jurisdictions uh, to engage in supply chain due diligence to identify and mitigate exposure. I think it's important to note that U.S. companies are not alone. Expectations are increasing around the world to address and identify forced labor exposure in global supply chains. Um, with respect to enforcement, CBP has stated that UFLPA detentions constitute less than 0.1% of goods imported into the United States. And since enforcement of the UFLPA began in June of last year, CBP has detained approximately $1 billion worth of goods uh, suspected of containing inputs made with forced labor in China. Um, it's important to note, however, that CBP has prioritized enforce, uh, enforcement relating to four goods, cotton, polysilicon, tomatoes, and aluminum. Uh, the scope of the UFLPA, however, is much larger than these four prioritized commodities. For instance, billions of dollars worth of raw materials, rare earth and critical minerals, and products exported from Xinjiang each year, including a significant uh, percentage of global lithium-ion batteries, 20% of the global production of calcium carbide, 10% of the global production of rayon, 9% of beryllium deposits, which I should note are a key rare earth mineral used for the production of uh, satellite and aviation components, um, and 8% of global pepper production. Uh, this matters because in addition to all of these raw materials and goods sourced from Xinjiang, the UFLPA also bans uh, products made with forced labor in other provinces in China. Sometimes that's forgotten. Uh, clearly, the scope of the UFLPA is broad, but CBP has been very explicit about the type of guidance that uh, companies should consider with respect to compliance. Uh, the challenge, of course, though, is the volume and scope of goods targeted under the UFLPA poses significant, chal uh, significant challenges for industry. Supply chains have become increasingly globalized, complex, and opaque, and the critical uh, challenge for industry to discover supply chain visibility and detect risk is compounded by the act's rebuttable presumption and the lack of a de minimis exception that was discussed earlier. Uh, this means that even an insignificant input of product produced in whole or in part with forced labor could result in an enforcement action. Uh, the global nature of supply chains further complicates compliance because CBP maintains the authority to detain goods imported in the United States from third countries. And this gets to a core issue that's been discussed already this morning. Since the UFLPA enforcement began in June of last year, CBP has attained $490 million worth of goods from Malaysia and over $369 million worth of goods from Vietnam. To provide a bit of perspective here, CBP has only detained $89 million worth of goods imported directly from China. These figures illustrate UFLPA transshipment risk and why the lack of a de minimis exception necessitates the need for due diligence in all suppliers, not just those located in China. It should also be noted that beyond the four product categories uh, uh, characterized for high priority for enforcement, CBP has publicly stated that it's considering other product categories that will be subject to enforcement. Um, regardless of any possible further announced priorities, as some in industry have requested, CBP guidance issued in 2021 and it amended last year sets forth red flags for forced labor exposure for all categories of products that pose UFLPA risk. These include things like labor transfers, supply chains connected to prisons, and any affiliates of the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps. The amended guidance is very clear and states that UFLPA compliance uh, requires supply chain mapping, the intelligence needed to identify and assess forced labor risk, training, monitoring of suppliers, and that uh, compliance is not static with UFLPA. It requires consistent uh, and regular uh, updates. 
So, so what's the so what? Uh, similar to industry responses when countering money laundering, sanctions, or any bribery compliance became priorities, CBP's enforcement uh, posture is a major driver for the material investments industry is making to address UFLPA due diligence and compliance. And as CBP's budget and resources expand to counter the forced labor mission, many in industry are certain to adapt with increased senior management attention and with support and budget for the technology and people needed to address risk. Um, in line with guidance, companies that make reasonable risk-based investments to identify risk uh, should be positioned to identify UFLPA uh, exposure and take uh, uh, measures to uh, mitigate that risk. Um, and as industry implements UFLPA compliance programs, global supply chains will evolve as companies mitigate that risk and build resilience. Observers have already pointed to the UFLPA's impact on supply chains related to green energy products, rare earth minerals, food items, and pharmaceutical precur uh, precursors. Uh, companies uh, that have those goods prioritized for detention by CBP have already started to see their supply chains evolve. Um, in summary, compliance with UFLPA is complex. Uh, this is similar to compliance with anti-money laundering, sanctions, anti-bribery, and other regulations. Uh, nonetheless, with senior management support in line with guidance, effective risk management programs can be established to identify UFLPA exposure and mitigate the risk of forced labor in global supply chains. Um, as DHS Undersecretary Silvers recently stated, over the years, things like anti-corruption and sanctions compliance have come to become standard pillars of corporate compliance programs. Forced labor needs to be one of those pillars as well. Thank you for your time this morning. <clears throat> Mr. Conklin, thank you very much uh, for your testimony, your insights, and, and your leadership. Uh, Ms. Iltebeer. Thank you, Chairman Smith and uh, Co-Chair Merkley and other valuable members of the uh, Commission. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at this hearing. My name is Alfidar Yiltebir and I was born in East Turkestan, Uyghur's homeland for where Uyghurs have been living for thousands of years and what China now calls the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Like many Uyghurs, my family also faced persecution at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. After waging more than six decades of repressive assimilationist policies to weaken and eliminate the Uyghur identity, the CCP under its General Secretary Xi decided to implement the final solution and resorted to genocide in the 21st century. The CCP's ultimate goal is to completely annihilate uh, the Uyghur identity and homogenize China's population by forcefully transforming Uyghurs into majority Han Chinese. To achieve this goal, the CCP has transformed Uyghur's homeland into a totalitarian surveillance state, detained millions of people in detention camps, forced labor camps, and formal prisons, and subjected Uyghur people to such inhumane conditions, including torture, sexual abuses, forced sterilization, forced labor, and forced separation of families. The main point I would like to stress today is that the Chinese government's campaign of forced labor is a critical part of China's systematic oppression of the Uyghur people and ongoing genocide in the Uyghur homeland. The Chinese government's forced labor practices are tearing apart the fabric of the Uyghur society, separating families and displacing them from their communities, stripping away their ethnic and religious identity and leading to a reduction in Uyghur population. I want to share a quick story of my friend Kalbe Nurgheni, who now lives around DC. In 2018, her sister Rana Gul was taken to a concentration camp for praying at her father's funeral and possessing Muslim's holy book. She was later sentenced to 17 years in prison and forced to work at a garment factory inside the prison. Her children's children were separated from her family. The Chinese government not only detained 12 other members of Kalbunur's family and sent them to camps and later to the prison, it, also, it has also been harassing her on the U.S. soil for speaking out about her detained family members. She received threatening messages directly from Chinese police almost every week last year. Many more members of the community have similar stories of loved ones being detained and exploited. This is one reason our community fought so hard for the passage of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act and why we continue to fight for its full enforcement. 
On behalf, on behalf of the Uyghur Americans, I would like to thank this, take this opportunity to thank Senator Rubio, Senator Merkley, Representative Smith, and Representative McGovern for your leadership, and to many others who were instrumental in passing the UFLPA. Thank you for refusing to make Americans complicit in China's genocide against Uyghurs and for putting universal values of human rights and dignity above economic interest. We were enjoyed and overjoyed with the passage of the UFLPA. We believe this new law would be a turning point to stopping China's genocide. We believed it would be a catalyst for greater awareness among businesses of the CCP's atrocities in this Uyghur homeland, that it would compel them to investigate and cut links to supply chains connected to Uyghur forced labor in the Uyghur homeland and across China. However, when I recently saw in my neighborhood grocery stores the red dates product produced by the Bingtuan, which facilitates Uyghur forced labor, it felt like a slap in my face. As an Uyghur American, every time I shop for clothing items, grocery items, or electronics, or when I look at cars or solar panels, I think about how many made in China products may have been made by a loved one in my hometown. The human cost of this forced labor is why it is so important to ensure that the UFLPA is fully and rigorously implemented the way it is intended. As Uyghur Americans, we are prepared to contribute to the successful implementation and enforcement of the UFLPA. We may not be able to close the camps overnight, to reunite our families this Ramadan, or to stop the Chinese government's mass sterilization of Uyghur women by the next UN session, and much more that we need to end this genocide. But as I sit here today, I can say with confidence that, to get confidence that together we can stop products made with Uyghur forced labor from entering into U.S. soil and make this genocide costly on China. We can be an example for our allies to implement similar laws so made in China products tainted with Uyghur forced labor cannot enter any markets that value human beings and fair trade. If there is one thing I can ask to the U.S. government, that would be to hold this Chinese government and affiliated entities accountable by imposing economic costs on Chinese officials and companies implementing, facilitating, and supporting this genocide. The United States passed two historical legislations. Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, signed by the Trump's administration, and the Uyghur For Forced Labor Prevention Act, signed by the Biden administration. Yet, as far as we know, no Chinese officials or entity has been sanctioned under these legislative authorities. Both administrations recognize China's atrocities as genocide, yet U.S. businesses are still operating in the genocide zone. U.S. companies are still selling technology to Chinese companies implementing this genocide. And U.S. companies are still investing in Chinese companies supporting the Chinese government's genocidal policies. We need to ensure to American technology or investment is flowing to Chinese companies that are linked to China's genocide against Uyghurs and no Chinese products tainted with Uyghur forced labor are entering our territory. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your testimony and leadership as well. Um, I just going to questions, uh, we would begin with a question um, to Ms. Siam or others who Ms. Murphy might want to answer this as well. A group of executives from 20 companies, including Walmart, General Motors, and Intel, have asked the U.S. government to hide key import data. One of the changes the group requests is to make data collected from vessel manifests confidential. Experts have argued that this would make it impossible to trace about half of the goods entering the United States. The group has also asked C P, uh, CBP to provide importers with advance notice whenever it suspects forced labor is being used, which activists have says endangers overseas whistleblowers. How do you view these proposed changes? What impact would they have on CBP's uh, enforcement capability and on the ability of researchers, reporters, and public to investigate forced labor in supply chains and to hold corporations accountable? Thank you for the question, Chairman Smith. Um, in a nutshell, these proposals should be summarily rejected. Um, last, 
last year, the Associated Press reported on attempts from these corporate members of the Commercial Customs Operations Advisory Committee, or the COAC, uh, where it revealed efforts to eviscerate existing customs transparency. And, and this customs transparency, what we have of it, is very little. As noted in my testimony earlier, we only have access to maritime shipping data. And we know thousands and millions of shipments are entering the United States, sub subject to both the US Tariff Act and the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act um, through air, land, rail, or road cargo. We call on Congress to mandate the disclosure of all modes of trade data, including all modes of transportation. In fact, the Human Trafficking Legal Center led a broad-based coalition of civil society organizations and sent a letter to the CBP commissioner, the then CBP commissioner, Chris Magnus, requesting that the agency reject this highly problematic proposal. The letter was signed by 38 organizations, including the AFL-CIO. The letter noted that the trajectory should be for more transparency, not less. This information, this trade data from all modes of transportation is critical to our efforts to trace forced labor risks across the supply chain. Thank you. Ms. Murphy, did you want to respond to that? Or anyone else? I agree entirely with Ms. Sham. Thank you. Let me ask you uh, on the de minimis issue. Uh, and again, Ms. Siam, you pointed out that on average, the U.S. receives 3 million uninspected de minimis packages per day. Uh, and in fiscal year 2022, uh, 22, the U.S. imported an estimated 685 million in de minimis uh, shipments. Um, is that a gaping loophole that needs to be closed? Thank you, Chairman, again for raising um, an important uh, issue and, and a loophole in UFLP enforcement. Um, this. The de minimis shipping environment is being used to circumvent the UFLPA. And, and the Bloomberg report that, that showed that companies like Shein um, were using Xinjiang cotton in their low value shipments being sent to the United States is a glaring example of this loophole. We were encouraged by the letter from Senator Warren, Senator Cassidy, and Senator Whitehouse addressed to Shein's CEO on the de minimis issue and asking the company to reveal its supply chain and use of Xinjiang cotton. This is an important step and we and we look forward to receiving um, the responses for on this letter uh, the de minimis standard cannot be a carte blanche for companies and for shippers to send whatever goods they want to the US market especially goods made using forced labor how confident are all of you that the applicability review is being done robustly uh, are these companies able to prove not made in Xinjiang and not made with forced labor because there's very little uh, uh, exposure of it by our own government. They, they don't report on it. And I'm wondering if, if that's a, a, an area that we need to get uh, much more information on. Um, definitely. We need more visibility into how CBP is currently reviewing applicability reviews. Importers have the ability to contest UFLPA's application on their shipments. And this is not subject to the disclosure requirements that are currently incumbent on those making requests to rebut the forced labor presumption. So a lot of reviews that are currently happening under the UFLPA, thousands of these, as the data dashboard will show, um, they are showing, the importers are showing that they have no connections to Xinjiang and they're not really rebutting the forced labor presumption. These reviews, um, in fact, we need more visibility into these reviews, including how many were rejected, what were the basis for conducting these reviews, and the standards applied by CBP to conduct these reviews. Let me ask you on the issue of transshipment, and Mr. Conklin, you might want to speak to this because you pointed out that $490 million from Malaysia, 369 from Vietnam. Uh, are these goods suspected to be uh, made with slave labor, or gulag labor? And secondly, um, you did point out um, uh, in your testimony a number of things, but I, I, uh, I, again, I thank you all of you for your testimony. But the, the, the um, polysilicone, which is obviously being used to make solar panels, which are growing, not diminishing in demand, uh, are they being made in Vietnam, uh, uh, but they're really being, much of it's coming from Xinjiang? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, regarding transshipment uh, uh, risks, it, 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 the UFLPA bans that raw material, right? So any product that's mined or manufactured in whole or in part in Xinjiang or, or with forced labor. So therefore, even if a commodity is manufactured in a third country, if it contains that raw material that's uh, representative of risk itself, um, therefore it, it's captured underneath of the, the law as, as written. 
I have some additional questions, but I'd like to yield to the co-chair, uh, Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And this process of trying to strengthen enforcement of this law is, is really critical. And you've all illuminated many aspects of it. I wanted to start, though, uh, Ms. Uh, Eltuber, uh, just with something that uh, you mentioned in terms of um, your friend Kalbinar Geni and her sister having been arrested and so forth, and that she, she is uh, receiving threatening messages directly from Chinese police almost every week. Now, she's living here in the US, and this issue of uh, transnational repression is one that this, this body has been trying to highlight, uh, and um, we're trying to uh, greatly uh, motivate the FBI to collect a lot more information about this Chinese effort because it's really suppressing free speech, free assembly, just the freedom of, of living without threats, and it's just so unacceptable. Um, I'd like to follow up with you later in regards to um, that or other cases as to how we can, can strengthen the collection of data and protect American citizens regarding transnational repression. Uh, and I just wanted to thank you for illuminating uh, uh, that issue. Uh, Mr. Conklin, you mentioned the four priorities of cotton, polysilicone, tomatoes, aluminum, uh, but all these other products that come out are relevant as well. Uh, does the U.S. government have the ability to expand the list now, or do they kind of have to come up to speed and build the systems and then expand the list? And uh, what are the next two or three things that should be added to that priority list? Uh, thank you for your question, Senator. Um, the UFLPA gives CBP the authority to, to ban any raw material or any product. So by prioritizing certain commodities for enforcement, it may send a signal uh, that all of the other commodities are therefore not relevant or do not pose risk. Um, I think that the challenge that, that CBP and, and industry both now are facing is that um, how to treat commodities that haven't been publicly identified for prioritized enforcement. Um, so if CBP is, is concerned or interested in expanding those authorities, uh, they already have the law on the book to detain any commodity. So there may not necessarily be a need to publicly prioritize extra commodity categories. All right. Um Thank you. I, I, I've had the impression that they undertook the, those priorities in order to develop expertise and in order to, the type of investigations necessary to try to understand how those things flow. And with the huge uh, breadth of, of commodities, I uh, feel like they'd do nothing effectively if they were split over every product. So it kind of made sense to me originally. But with experience, I think the point has to be made that, that uh, far more products need to be carefully examined. Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Shiam, um, you mentioned in your testimony that 1,723 products are, that were, were, were suspected or shipments that were suspected are still pending CBP review. Does that mean there's some set of warehouses around the country where there's 1,723 shipments uh, sitting waiting evaluation? Um, it is my understanding that these shipments are either pending review from CBP or that, this, or that CBP is waiting for documentation from companies that have actually sent these shipments to see whether they are subject to the Weaker Forced Labor Prevention Act. The ultimate disposition of these, I'm not clear about the ultimate disposition of these goods. But they've been seized. They aren't allowed to go through those 1,723 shipments. Um, correct. These, uh, the, the shipments that are pending have not been yet released into U.S. commerce. Okay. Um, and you mentioned that we should make sure that Mexico and Canada are not dumping grounds. And uh, Dr. Murphy, I think you also uh, addressed uh, the question of, you know, how do we, how do we ensure that this isn't simply a bifurcated uh, situation uh, where we get the products made outside Xinjiang that can be documented, while other countries therefore get the, um, the products of slave labor. And it sounded like f from uh, uh, Dr. Murphy, I think it was your testimony, that a number of other companies are, or countries are working to establish similar laws. I'd like to get a little more clarity on how Mexico, Canada, and Europe are, are doing. Are they just considering the question or are some of them close to passing laws? 
Uh, there are a number of different laws, each of which have very different uh, clauses in them. And uh, Ms. Jom is more on top of these things as she's a lawyer. But I will say that um, uh, the, the bills that are pending in the EU, for instance, um, are designed to stop import of forced labor made goods in general once they enter the market, um, not at the border. And so that's a difference in their laws uh, that are pending. But I also think that one important difference is that it addresses forced labor globally and not simply the Uyghur region. Um, it doesn't include a region-wide ban, which I think is something that needs to be a part of that bill. But there's also something aspirational about it in that they, the law is meant to stop the import of any forced labor made good, which is something that the U.S. is uniquely uh, equipped with. And uh, I think it's a surprise to people in the EU, for instance, that they don't have a law similar to the, the, the Tariff Act. And so these laws are still being reviewed and discussed, and we're, we're hopeful that they'll pass. But it, it's worrisome. I think that the U.S. government needs to have as its diplomatic strategy of the UFLPA, real encouragement, real alignment and engagement with our, uh, you know, like-minded uh, partners about how to not just create the law, but how to enforce it, because that's also a major concern uh, of, of, of other governments. Should the uh, U.S. be holding a, a, a meeting of the trade ministers and experts from, at least from, at this moment, from Canada, Mexico, uh, and Europe uh, to really push for a common alignment uh, in terms of uh, strategy. Absolutely, and you know the the laws are aligned. Uh, technically on paper, but the enforcement strategy is not. And I think there needs to be significantly more communication of both strategy and data and information because it is a monumental task that CBP is undertaking. And they could be doing it for the benefit of global partners, not simply for the United States. Ms. Shiam, do you want to add on that? Sure. Uh, thank you, Senator Merkley. Um, just to speak to the efforts currently underway uh, in, within the USMCA context, Canada amended its customs tariff back in 2020 to include an import prohibition, but is seriously lagging behind on enforcement. Media reports suggest that Canada has detained one shipment, which was subsequently released after a successful, uh, after a successful appeal by the importer. Um, so we are concerned by the, the slow implementation from, from, from our neighbor. Mexico, on the other hand, did announce its import ban uh, in February 23 and will begin implementing in May. So, so the time is ripe for the three countries to convene the trade ministers to ensure that we are aligned on the ways these import bans are going to be enforced and specifically make sure that we take a region-wide approach to the issue of forced Uyghur labor. And, and under Article 23, 3.6 of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, all three countries are obligated to identify and track the cross-border movement of goods made using forced labor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I just uh, got informed the clock is malfunctioning, so uh, my time is actually up. But I just want to close by saying that there are many ideas and thoughts you all have presented for us to follow up on in terms of uh, pushing forward. I, I, this act is is a really significant act, and but it will be meaningless without really effective uh, uh, follow up. And I want to make sure that our government doesn't simply kind of pretend to enforce it. Uh, and I know they'll face lots of pressures from from different companies to to not take too close of look or be too strong. But when we are really blocking a significant number of uh, shipments, and I was disturbed at how few have been uh, blocked. I was disturbed that it sounds like many of them may have simply been then re-exported from the United States to other countries directly, meaning that we're having uh, no impact if that's the case. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done, and, and thank you all. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair Berkeley. I'd like to now uh, yield to Michelle Steele. I believe she's still online. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I'm i going to uh, ask the same question to uh, Ms. Uh, Elkeber. I also sit on the China Select Committee. I recently spoke 
with the survival of the Jinjiang region that is now using her platform to raise awareness to the world. She shared the emotional stories about women being raped and experiencing other types of sexual assault. Can you share about living conditions and qual quality of life in regards? Thank you. Um, so the recent condition of uh, East Turkestan, China, is uh, the genocide is still going on, and millions of Uyghurs are still in the camps. And uh, because of the total control of the uh, region, we don't get uh, many information. Uh, China made cosmetic changes, you know, like less visible checkpoints every corner, but surveillance cameras are everywhere. And everyone's phone has downloaded this app that government can monitor everything they do daily. Uh, people are very scared. Uh, most people are sent to remote prisons, even though they said, China said that they were released. Uh, there is extrajudicial trial and the people are sent to prison, as I said. Uh, I, Besides that, uh, I think you mentioned uh, uh, what's happening to women, the sexual abuses and rape. Uh, China has been uh, strategically targeting Uyghur women for decades. Uh, before the Uyghurs were, uh, especially women, transferred to inner China uh, to factories, so they can't give birth. Uh, they're away from their families. Uh, they can't marry. And even if they have children, they were far from their family, so they cannot transfer their cultural, uh, religious values, their identity their, uh, to their children. And children were also, when both uh, parents were sent to camps, factories, uh, for the forced labor, they were also sent to boarding school, uh, state-run orphanages, kindergartens, raised as a loyal subject to CCP. They were also stripped away their identity, their language, their cultural beliefs, tradition. So that is the situation now. Thank you so much. And I want to ask uh, Ms. Siam, last year, Actually, I asked all the major sponsors of Beijing Olympics to use their platform to raise awareness about the human rights abuse of CCP because they've been um, gathering billions of dollars from advertising fee. They could have gone to use just a little bit of that money to let the whole world know that exactly what CCP has been doing to Uyghur. It's not just Uyghur uh, minority communities, but like religious communities, Muslim, Christian, you name it. And they're going after all these innocent people and they have to be staying in the, in the jail. And it's a labor camp. Plus all those families had to be separated. I mean, you know, we cannot really heard of in this uh, world that they are doing awful, awful things that CCP has been evil. Not a single company, interesting, acknowledged my letter. Now, some of these same corporations might be trying to hide the data related to Xinjiang forced labor. Can you share why we need transparency to ensure that products coming to the market aren't made with forced labor because it has to be prohibited? At the same time, that what we really have to do expose what CCP has been doing. Thank you for the question. Um, I will try to briefly respond, and, and, and I'm sure my other witnesses maybe can add more insight. There's definitely an urgent need for companies to reveal, to, for us to have more visibility into supply chains. And the UFLPA law is creating that expectation around traceability um, with the UFLPA implementation strategy and with CBP's guidance for importers. There are clear expectations on companies that import products, especially in the high risk um, and the, the high priority sectors, to trace their supply chains down to the raw material. Now, there are strategies that companies could be using to obfuscate their supply chains, and we need to investigate those um, uh, very seriously. For companies in, in, in the US that continue to tolerate forced labor in supply chains, we need to look at what other authorities exist. Uh, CBP has existing authorities to impose 
of civil penalties on U.S. companies for continuing to import products made using forced labor. And CBP did do that once in 2020 by imposing a $575,000 penalty on a U.S. company for importing um, the artificial sweetener stevia made using prison labor in China. We urge uh, the agency to, to continue imposing these penalties because they send a strong message to industry that CBP does not tolerate forced labor in supply chains. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Steele. Uh, Ms. Weston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here to with us today. Products made with forced labor have no place in the American marketplace, and I'm proud to get, begin to be introducing the Uyghur Forced Labor Disclosure Act in this Congress. My bill would require publicly traded companies and those asking to issue trades as securities and trade securities on the U.S. exchanges to report any links to Xinjiang and forced labor, both as, a, both as a condition of being registered and as a part of ongoing financial annual disclosures to investors. In line with this legislation, and given, given the credible allegations made against Gene for its use of Uyghur and forced labor in its intention to execute IPO in the coming months, I also plan to lead a letter to the SEC requesting that they require Xin to certify that the company does not violate the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act as a condition of its registration. At the same time, concern exists that the audits of Chinese facilities and supply chains can, can be easily manipulated or falsified. Um, Ms. Shyam, you talked a little bit. Shyam, you talked a little bit about the about things, more more things that we can do to 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 help um, to help to to help identify the use of forced labor in supply chains, particularly supply, CCP backed companies. But is there is there more that we can do given that given that the uh, given that 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 the, the 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 audits that often take place in that country are, are under pressure and and are not really reliable? Thank you for that question, and th that's a very important point. And and we certainly believe that it, it is impossible to conduct due diligence in the Uyghur region, and there has been retaliation for those that attempt uh, to do so. And thank you for your efforts um, on, 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 on investments and, 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 and making sure that US companies are not complicit. We do need to compel divestment from um, these problematic supply chains. And uh, as noted in my testimony, and, and, and as uh, uh, Ms. Iltabi uh, Elfidar noted earlier, we do need to have a whole of government approach to address this issue, and there are tools that are complementary to the import restrictions under the Week of Forced Labor Prevention Act and the Tariff Act, including um, the economic sanctions or Magnitsky sanctions, as well as the export controls uh, from the Department of Commerce. So I encourage uh, a whole of government approach and the use of these complementary tools. Does anybody else have any suggestions about other things that we can do in order to, to help cut back on this use of forced labor? I think there should be a cost for China. We need to impose, uh, you know, cost penalties for the willful, uh, you know, violations of this law. And also, I believe uh, we should reduce the de minimis rule, mm -hmm. uh, so China can't continue to profit from the genocide from the Uyghur forced labor. Like Bing Tuan products, for example, are still on the shelves, and UHRP's report showed, you know, all the linked uh, companies to Uyghur forced labor. Those companies should be sanctioned. The companies they do business with Bing Tuan should be sanctioned. It's a very good, there's a very good segue there because I wanted to ask about the, the loopholes in the de minimis rule and the way, that, the way that they can get around the rules, particularly as it relates to CCP controlled companies like Sheen. Maybe headquartered in Singapore or elsewhere, but, but Kim to ensure an enormous share of the US market. Should Congress require the CBP to collect more information on the de minimis shipments? Uh, for the de minimis rules, I think uh, Shiam or Laura Murphy is more expert on this. Professor but uh, we know that China is taking advantage of this rule and uh, separating their shipments to smaller amount and still, you know, sending and we are receiving those deliveries. Dr. Murphy, do you think that do you think that there's a way to to crack down on the de minimis shipments and also to maybe aggregate them in some way for other consumers? I do think that more data and more accurate data should be required for de minimis shipments. But I also think that uh, I welcome the disclosure legislation that you're describing here. And I also share Cong uh, Congresswoman Steele's concern that companies are not willing to be more public about their 
ethical commitments, they're more concerned about the retaliation of the Chinese government than they are about the moral outrage or even the penalties in the United States. And so it's clear that we need some kind of penalty regime within the UFLPA that makes it more costly to not obey the or not comply with the UFLPA than it is to just stick your head in the sand and hope you don't get enforced against, um, which is what is essentially happening now, whether it's for de minimis um, packages and, and companies that are operating through that mechanism or for other companies that are um, at the moment not receiving a ton of scrutiny just yet. I'd also say that adding a, 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 like in, in creating more funding for um, for the the creation of the entities list for the expansion of the entities list would be important, something that Congress could do. And I also think that um, uh, adding priority sectors, as we discussed earlier, could be a route to informing the import community of, of additional high priority sectors that the Chinese government has incentivized moving out to the Uyghur region. We don't have to guess what the Uyghur region is producing. We don't have to uh, say that it's every single thing that's coming in that we have to inspect. In fact, the Chinese government produces uh, annual and every five-year uh, directives that tell the Uyghur region government what to produce and, and tell companies, give incentives to companies to move out to the region. And so we know that, for instance, critical minerals are high on their list, steel and aluminum are high on their list, and these are critical to our infrastructure and to the creation of practically every product that we make. A, a uh, cotton is not the only textile that they're making there, but they, they're they making viscose and um, all kinds of synthetic polyester, these kinds of things. So we can name those products as priority sectors, the ones that we know the Chinese government is, is incentivizing um, in the Uyghur region. So these are some of the things that we can do to sort of uh, make the, the UFLPA enforcement more robust. And that's why that's why the whole the whole burden shifting from 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 the from the producer to be able to produce it, from putting on the producer to prove that it is not that is not that is not a product of forced labor so much as it's so, so important in, in the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, isn't it? Yeah, I would like to add to that that a secondary sanction bill should be introduced, reintroduced because that is we believe going to fix the loopholes and the gaps of the first bill. One of the things that's so disturbing about this is that, that not only the Chinese companies, but the U.S. companies kind of viewed as a cost of doing business, right? So they, as, long as, they can, as long as they can make more money, they're perfectly content to look the other way on forced labor. That shouldn't be happening in this country at all. Mr. Conklin, is there anything else that, that we can do at CBP to make sure that we, we improve, improve the way that we're enforcing the law? I, I think the comments about a whole of government approach to the UFLPA and to forced labor is spot on. Um, you have a whole variety of other government agencies that have a history of uh, with export controls, um, sanctions. Uh, there's guidance and all sorts of, of good policies that have come out um, that that could be applied for this context. But I think the the ideas posed by others on the panel are 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 perhaps the way to start. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired. I'll give it back. Thank you very much, Ms. Weston. Um, I'd like to just ask uh, one or two final questions, and uh, if you have any additional, Ms. Weston, I'd gladly yield, or Ms. Steele. Um, first, uh, you know, the whole idea of the de minimis being $800, and as you again pointed out, uh, Ms. I am, 3 million uninspected de minimis packages per day. I mean, who even knows if those packages are 800 or 2,000 or 1,500, who knows? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're uninspected. Uh, when did the number get raised to, I mean, who set $800 as a de minimis number? Uh, was it done by administrative? I don't recall it being in the bill. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. My understanding that it used to be 200 and now it's been raised. I mean, 800 is a lot of money, uh, but it's uninspected, so it could be much more. Uh, how do we rein in on that? Thank you, Chairman Smith, um, for for your interest in this topic. Um, I think we do need to pay attention to what data points we can collect from de minimis sh shippers um, and also closely scrutinize this de minimis shipping environment. Right now, CBP is piloting a type, um, an 86 type entry, commercial entry process as part of its customs enforcement. But this is a voluntary um, measure. Companies can choose not to follow and, 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 and disclose uh, details of their supply chain. So we need to make uh, 
collection of certain specific sh uh, data points, including country of origin, value, the tariff, uh, the HS classification, the pa uh, a, a part and parcel of the de minimis shipping environment. How, how big are these packages? I mean, we know that we couldn't stop fentanyl coming in uh, during uh, for, for years. It's still coming in, obviously, in huge amounts. Um, who's even looking? Yes, that is, that is a big concern. And a lot of these packages, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, could be coming by mail through express courier services. And one strategy to circumvent this could also to be break down bigger packages into smaller eight, under $800 shipments and into many shipments. And this is what we, we are concerned that companies are doing to circumvent the law. Right. I would hope that the Border Patrol, the CBP, would, would at least do a, 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 an aggressive look uh, at some of this to find out whether or not we're all being duped, that, that all kinds of goods are coming in illegally, uh, made with slave labor and uh, forced labor and uh, you know, right under our nose. So I, I, this is an area we really need to focus on, I think, uh, big time. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Ms. Murphy, you, you said that uh, in your, your research team has identified 5,500 companies operating in the Uyghur region. Uh, in your opinion, should they all or most be placed on the entity list? And if not, what is the best approach for using the entity list, entity list as a tool and a signal? Thank you for that. Yeah, we've identified 55,000 companies operating in the Uyghur region, 3,300 in the textile industry alone. Um, we have this data, we've shared this data with U.S. government uh, agencies, various agencies. And I think that probably... Ideally, I would like to see all 55,000 companies that are operating in the Uyghur region named in the entity lists because we presume if we presume that the that forced labor dominates the region under the USLPA, we're presuming that all companies that operate in the region should be um, having their goods stopped and therefore they should be added to the entity list. This may be, I have been, um, it has been suggested to me that this a lot of companies to add to the list, uh, but I have some ideas for how we might um, uh, start to add companies to the list in a way that is robust and, and vigorous, but also um, gives companies enough information to go on to be able to begin to exclude the suppliers that we know are the worst actors. The US, the FLEDF can add can start by adding companies that are state-owned operations that have been instrumental in the development of the um, of the labor tra the labor transfer programs. Some of these companies have transferred five thousand people to their own facilities alone. Some of the companies, some of these state-owned enterprises, have run universal uh, training centers that they call universities that are closed. Are locked down, people are not allowed to leave. And then they are they those people are then summarily transferred to factories all over the region. These companies are egregious bad actors and they're not on our, our entities list. And we have this information. It is it is my suspicion based on media reports about what's getting stopped that CBP is in fact stopping goods made by some of these companies. But but importers don't know necessarily who those companies are, and they they could know if they were added to the entity list. It's also possible to add all of the textile companies that we know to be operating in that weak region, because then companies could then link them to, or importers could link them to their parent companies so that they can pressure the parent companies to move out of the Uyghur region, to stop sourcing from the Uyghur region. Um, otherwise, importers don't actually know who these companies are that are most connected to the to, to the Uyghur region and are sourcing from there. There are companies that are named that are engaged in these um, in the critical mineral sector, in the automotive sector that we know to be um, be actively involved and to be having to, and to have an import nexus to the United States, those companies should absolutely be added to the import uh, into the UFLPA entity list as well. It wouldn't take that long because civil society has produced significant research, really unpacking all of the evidence that is out there. And many groups like mine have handed this data over to the U.S. government. We publish reports about them. And so there's more than enough information in the public sphere now to really vigorously add more companies to the, the entity list to, 
to be a signal to, to the Uyghur community and to advocacy groups that um, that the UFLPA entity lists are being taken seriously, but also to, to show the import community where they can begin the process of eliminating um, forced labor make goods. Thank you so very much for that excellent answer and re recommendations. Let me ask Mr. Conklin, um, should all fast fashion goods from Temu uh, be subject to a rebuttable presumption and should the app be banned because of privacy concerns like TikTok? Uh, thanks for your question. I, I don't know the, the data piece with Temu, so I'm not really in a position to provide too much uh, guidance on that. But with respect to what products should be banned from importation into the United States, I would just note that um, regardless of what the company is, regardless of how much the shipment costs, there is uh, a law on the books that bans all products manufactured in whole or in part with forced labor. Um, so if a company or a supply chain is tainted with that, uh, then the law should, uh, I believe, apply. Thank you. Um, before we close, if you have any final comments you'd like to make, any of our distinguished witnesses or uh, Ms. Weston or Ms. Steele, uh, I do want to point out that yesterday I did a letter to Chairman Xi Jinping um, asking to visit uh, the Uyghur region. Uh, I based it on a, uh, a diplomat in the Chinese um, embassy here in Washington, uh, sent an email to my office after the legislation to stop forced organ, organ harvesting act passed, uh, which was my bill, and I spoke very strongly on the floor about it, and I think it's an outrage beyond words uh, that they are murdering uh, young Uyghur men and women, average age 28, in order to uh, steal their organs, one to three per person. And um, uh, this uh, minister counselor for, counselor for Congressional Affairs in Washington, Joe Zheng, stated, and this is his quote from the email, China fully protects the rights and interests of all ethnic minorities, including uh, Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and the living standards and human rights protections of all ethnic groups continue to improve. Uh, he, I wrote and said, I'd like to lead a delegation there and get a visa to go there. Hopefully we, we could get a, a week or 10 days to, to really do a full-scale uh, trip there. Um, and, and I especially am buoyed by the hope when the Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson welcomed foreigners to visit Xinjiang uh, to, quote, see with their own eyes he was asked at a March 27th press conference if China would be willing to invite a U.S. congressional delegation to the region. Uh, and he said the door to Xinjiang is always open and that people from all countries are welcome to visit. So in my capacity as chairman, I have written to Xi Jinping asking uh, to approve that visit. So stay tuned. My hope is that it will be approved. It would be a very serious, serious undertaking. I hope we would have unfettered access uh, to the camps and to talk to officials there, and above all, to talk to individual Uyghurs without any fear of retaliation. Uh, and there is precedent for that, that that I've worked on in the past, where you get a prior approval uh, with regards to that. But of all, to see for ourselves, they're saying they have nothing to hide. Well, let us come, and we will, you know, we'll pick the dates when we're at, not in session, and my colleagues and I will will travel there. So, hopefully, that comes to fruition. And um, so, if any of you have any final comments, uh, and that goes for you as well, Ms. Wexton. Um, okay, okay. Before we close. Well, thank you so very, very much for your insights, your written testimonies, your oral presentations were extraordinary and really does help us significantly uh, providing a path forward as to what our next step should be. So deeply, deeply grateful. Hearings adjourned. Thank you.